I would play his songs over and over again. And then one day I realized the songs were written by this wonderful guy that was right next to me, who was a friend of mine. And I was going, you wrote that song? Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> I was like, I was like, breath. I was like, I mean, he is a songwriter. He's not just any songwriter, but a two-time Academy Award. Grammy and Golden Globe nominee whose songs have sold over 65 million copies. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, uh, let me throw out some names. Whitney Houston, Barbara Streisand, Tina Turner, Luther Vandross, Patti LaBelle, Shaka Khan, L L Kenny Loggins. Can I keep on going? I can. I mean, Dolly Parton, James Ingram, Barry Manilow. Okay, Dolly Parton, did I say that? Anyway, but behind all of that is, is this amazing man, uh, this amazing creative genius, Alan Rich. Alan Rich. Alan Rich. That was a good intro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's true. It's everything you said was the truth, but you know, sometimes it's the way you say it. You said it with a lot of enthusiasm. Thank you. Well, I mean, that's how I feel too. I mean, I get excited about these, uh, uh, you know, I mean, people like you who have brought so much joy to so many through. Well, thank you. And you, you're very, you've been very fortunate to have a lot, to have a long list of people that you've interviewed, high, very high caliber people. You've been very, you know, you've been very lucky and they've been lucky. Well. It's, it's a joy. Look at that smile. I love your glasses. Hey, where are your glasses? Today? Wait, wait, let me get them. <laughs> Thanks to Alan, I now have my glasses. And they look so cute on you. Thank you. Seriously, these, these are Burberry. You know, I have 24 pair of eyeglasses. <laughs> Someday I have to go to your 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 glass closet and check them all out. Uh, yeah, I have to, way too many. That's because I don't have hair, so I have glasses. It's it's all gorgeous. So I have to say, you you I mean, a songwriter. Did you, did you always know you wanted to be a songwriter? Um, I knew since I was five years old I wanted to be in show business. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to be a famous singer. That's what I was hoping to be famous singer, uh, songwriter. Um, and I did do a lot of singing in my early days. Um, and I did headline a lot of the top rooms in New York. And, um, and then I came out here and sang a bit, but I, I, really virtu I really did concentrate on my songwriting when I came out to Los Angeles. Right, 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 right. Now, before that though, I mean, I was reading about, I mean, your website's stunning. It, it, it's just, I mean, and to go and, and hear your music. You can thank my friend Kenny Morse for that. Kenny, Kenny did my website. But I mean, you know, um, a lot of people have very modern ones. I just, I think mine is nice. And, uh, I, I appreciate that you like it. No, it's, it's wonderful. It's really wonderful. And I was reading about, you know, your childhood and how it seemed like your parents, your father and your mother were so such a, a, a force behind you? Uh, they will, both were for different reasons. Uh, my, my dad, um, he, you know, he had a very good singing voice. He loved music. You know, when I was a little kid, I was brought up on really classic singers. My dad, first song I ever heard in my life was Hush Now, Don't Explain by Billie Holiday. Yeah. My dad would play that every Sunday. He'd take his patrol out and play all the records. After he played Duke Ellington, he'd Play, um, just all the top, top. That's who I was introduced to. Yeah. Um, Sarah Vaughan was his favorite. So I would play all, he played all the Sarah Vaughan songs. And, um, and my mom, my mom was, um, she, she was a force because she would, she would push, she was like a Jewish, strong Jewish mother. Yeah. Yeah. Know? And, um, so the, the two made a good combination in terms of inspiring me and pushing me. Now, did your dad introduce you more to the music where your mom introduced you more to the movement? Well, you know, um, my mom didn't introduce me to the movement. 
my mom used to, you know, when my brother, I have a twin brother and I have a younger sister. Yeah. And when we were little kids, my mom used to um, teach us a little dance routine. And we used to sing the song side by side. Oh, we ain't got a barrel of money. Sunny, but we're traveling along, singing a song side by side. And we wear the matching outfits and we'd go from class to class and sing our song in the, in, in, when we were in first and second grade. Oh, I love that. And, and even when we were in school pictures, if you see our first and second grade pictures in third grade, all the kids were dressed one way and my mother had my brother and I in these striped sport jackets. Oh, I love that. Stood out from the rest of the, the rest of the crowd. Everybody else was wearing, you know, plain shirts or nice white shirts, but yeah. not the rich brothers. Not the rich brothers. How is it having a twin brother? Just the best. I bet. I have I have, you know, I have a fantastic I really do have a fantastic twin brother. I love him two pieces. And he's two he's two inches taller, two minutes older. Um I, he's very, very successful, very sweet and nice. And, um, and I look at him like my big brother because he's, he's much more practical than me and grounded than me. I'm a little more flighty than him. You know, um, and my brother's also talented. My brother owned a, gar a company in the garment center with his um, husband yeah. um, for, uh, they had a ladies hand knit company that was very successful. And, um, and then, and, my brother was one of only two kids yeah. in high school who got into art and design and performing arts high school. Wow. Um, so he was very talented. But for the last 14 years in New York City, he's been a very successful real estate um, broker. Ah, okay. After 30, 40 years in the business, in the design business, he said it's time for change. Right. So he's been selling apartments in New York City and in the Hamptons um, for the last 14 years. This is and then I have a younger sister. I, and and she is she more practical or is she sort My of- My sister was a lead singer in a rock band, which that's how she met her husband. She ah. was gorgeous with this incredible little body and a really kind of little rock voice. And, um, and she auditioned for this band. She fell in love, like you always hear with, I, I think it was the guitar player. Right. And she would head the band and that's how they met, fell in love, got married, had a baby and you know, and now she lives in Florida. Oh, wow. It's nice to have a, I'm, I'm blessed with a wonderful brother as well. So it's to have a, night, a brother and sister. Thank God for um, siblings. And, a ta you know, all talented in their own right. Do you remember, well, what was the first song? <laughs> what was the first song that you wrote? I do remember. <laughs> it was a song called I'll Be Glad to Grow Old with You. When did you write that? Mm, well, when I graduated college, I felt like I had something to say, so I started writing songs. I, I, was, I was not an early developer I, in songwriting. I started when I graduated from college. Okay. And, um, and uh, when I was in my, in, let's see, in my early 20s, or maybe my early, early 20s, um, um, I, I won the... Uh, the Catskill Mountains talent search for all the hotels and all the bungalow colonies. And it was the first time, I think I was 18. It was the first time I worked at the, at the Home Whack Hotel and the Pines Hotel and the Raleigh Hotel. And I'd never sung with a band. And every week they'd have a talent contest, the hotel from all the, uh, the whole Catskill Mountains. Yeah. And then they had 10 winners and at the end for the 10 weeks. And then at the end, they'd have a big uh, talent contest. And I won one week. And then I got to sing with a band and oh my God, it was the greatest. I was so scared and it was so exciting. Was that when you sang in front of a thousand people? Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> and first time I ever sang in front of a thousand people. And, um, and when they announced the winner, I just was so excited to be there. I didn't even realize they announced my name. <laughs> I was clapping for the winner and then so it's, it's you. I said, I said, I had no, I, I had no idea. So, wow. um, and, you know, I thought a lot of things were going to happen, and fortunately they didn't. But I, I was taking class, you know, um, voice lessons, and I was taking dance class with Phil Blacks in New York City. And yeah. I was going on auditions, and I was appearing at Reno Sweeney's and the Grand Finale and all those clubs. And um, then um, I got a, a little publishing deal at Love Zager, who did Ua Ua Let's All Chant and a lot of other songs. 
Yeah. And that was my first foray. They, I was handpicked by Sissy Houston, open Sissy Houston's gig uh, uh, shows at R Reno Sweeney's. Right. And um, and I sang some of my original songs and their publisher, Sissy's publisher was in the audience, which was Love Zager, yeah. Susie McCusker. And oh, I'm trying to remember um, the people who were there, but but it was a very successful company. And that's where I, a lot of famous songwriters came out of there. Doug James, who wrote, How Am I Supposed to Live Without You? And Doug Frank, who was head of film music at Warner Brothers and just a lot of a batch of people. Um, oh, I love um, Scott. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, it was, listen, it wasn't an easy road. It was just like a mini Brill building. We all had cubicles where we'd write in. And when there, when there was um, a project, that they were submitting, you know, the artists, they were submitting songs for, for certain recording artists. Mm -hmm. We each go in one by one and play our songs. And I'd see everybody coming out with uh, a smile on their face. And I kept on getting rejected over and over and over again. My songs, I just could not land anything until the year I was, um, right before I moved to, to California, I finally got my first song recorded with one of the groups. I don't even remember, what was it called? What was the name of the group? Well, I don't even remember the song, but um, but you know, it was very, it was just like a microcosm of the real world, very competitive. You're with all your friends, but everybody else was competing to, for the slots on the record. Wow. Then I'd see everybody come out and say, oh my God, I'll just land this song on Sissy's record. I'll just land a song on, on the four um, tops, or I'll just land, you know, and, and uh, not me. Yeah. I was, you know, so well, I, and then, I, I, kind of, I kind of made up for it years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to go, just while we're still in, in the early days, there were two things that I read. Number one, I, that I saw that you played Robin in a radio show. Yeah, if, in, high, in high school, um, WNYC or NYE was a radio. WNYC? Yes, NYC. I auditioned, uh, um, there were 2,000 kids that auditioned three classes at Lincoln Center and um, an ability to go to the radio show and audition for parts every week. And I was one of the hundred of the 2000 that got accepted into the program. So I went, I got free lessons at Lincoln Center on the weekends. My brother would go to art class um, uh, in New York City as well. We would take the subway together and he would go and then we'd meet afterwards. But I got, um, it was pretty exciting. and. I felt very honored. And then they were doing um, uh, shows all throughout New York in the summertime, but uh, my parents had a little bungalow in the Catskill Mountains. So I had, a, and I was, I was very young, I was 15 or 16. So my parents didn't want me to stay in New York by myself. So I, I didn't do the summer tours with the, but I did go and audition and I did end up doing uh, Robin in a Batman and Robin series in WNY. Uh, one thing that really, when I was reading it this morning, it it actually made me tear up because, you know, we all go through these moments of like, ah, oh, should I be in this business? Am I good enough? And this and that. And I read that you played in our town, Constable Warren, and that you had nine lines and you couldn't get them out? Well, I had nine lines in the high school play. Yeah. And I think there were two performances. Hmm. And I forgot all nine lines every time. I went on stage. I made up nine complete lines. Wow. And then in college, I was in another play. Yeah. I did not say one line right. I could not remember my lines and someone else had to say the lines because otherwise I was going to screw everybody else up. So they said the line for me. I said, I don't know what I said, but even in college, I couldn't. I, it wasn't well, my you, thing. Know what, you know what's so interesting about that, though, because sometimes I like, ah, oh, the, the lines, the lines. Um, but here you are, sometimes we think, oh, I, my life is ruined as this, I couldn't get through the nine lines. And then you get nominated for a, a Grammy, an Oscar, and you win, and you know, so. I, I didn't win. I was, nom I was nominated for two Academy Awards, two Grammys, um, a Golden Globe, and I was nominated for an Emmy this past year for the, you know, for the digital series After Forever. I was one of the producers with my twin brother. Yeah. This is wonderful. And, um, but, but no, I, I'm, I'm an EGOT, uh, almost, I'm no Tony, but I'm nominated for, you know, 
um, Emmy, Grammy, Golden Globe, Oscar. Never, never a winner, but I feel like a winner because it was such oh, an no, no, incredible. No, no. I have to, I have to change that because you are a winner because the hearts that you have given so much. You know, the, I, I wrote down the word love. I was looking at all your songs, and the reason I love your work so much is that it it deals so much with the heart and with love. I think you're right, and you know, I have a I've had a writing partner, Judd Friedman, for the last thirty years. Um, I've had a, and we both always try to move and touch people in our songs. Mm -hmm. That is our goal, and um, though it's not in, in style that much on the radio today, um, you know, and we were told not to write ballads, but we had magic in our ballads. It was something special that we brought to the table that we could not, if someone, if they told us don't write ballads, you can't get them recorded. But it's what we did and had our, our special something with. And so um, we did it anyway. And our biggest hits were our ballads. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I one of the things that, when I said at the beginning, I was, one of my favorite songs ever, my top, not top 10, top five, is uh, I, I just had to just hear, had to hear your voice. Yeah. It's funny you say that, because I, I, I can honestly say that I think that out of my catalog, more buds run to you, more people talk about that song. Really? Yeah, so yeah, they do. And you know, and, um, and you know, I think what, what you, were, um, you feel from it is the honesty I may, I try to write my songs. I'm not a fancy songwriter. I'm not a fancy lyricist, but I am a conversationalist. And I try to make believe the person is sitting across from me and I'm saying the, saying the words as if I'm telling the person across from me what I need to say to them. Mm. And so if you look at the lyric, it really rings very true for, to what a conversation would be when you fall in love with somebody and you break up with them, you still love them. And you promise that you're gonna spend some time apart but yet you can't do it. You just call them on the phone, just to even hear them say hello, and then you hang up. So that's what that I just had to hear your voice was about. And Judd put such a beautiful melody to it. Yeah. And Olita Adams sang such a sang uh, it so beautifully. Ah, uh, that voice, that woman. And she's in. Yeah, I I did not like the video of the song because the video had nothing to do with the song. Yeah. It had, it was um, Alita Adams wearing a very sexy outfit, you know, instead of her being in a, in a room late at night by a phone, you know, maybe, you know, but she looked really nice and she sang it incredible, but the video really didn't have anything to do with, with the honesty of the song. Well, it's interesting list, hearing that story about that song, which is so important in my life. I mean, it, it, it's interesting how we as artists can create something that just it is seriously a ripple effect it's i appreciate that but i and i feel the same way you know we, i wrote i've written two or three other songs for alita and one of them with brenda russell we will meet again and um and i still every once in a while someone says you know when i say that i wrote this says, you know that's what we played at my grandma's funeral well, that's what i sang at my grandma and i, and I you know you're in a room a lot of the time and you don't get the feedback, but it really does move and touch you. You know, I remember when I um, had written, co-written a song for In Sync with Alan Chipley and Rick Knowles. And it was on their first record and, you know, it's the record sold 10 million copies. And we had one of the singles called I Drive Myself Crazy. And I was invited to an In Sync concert. Yeah. And it was like packed to the gills with kids and their moms. It was just screaming like, you know, like, rock star screaming. And then when they sang our song, I looked around and every single little kid and their mother was singing our lip, you know, the, the words to our song. It didn't, it didn't make me feel egotistical, it made me feel humbled. It's most of the time you're in a little room and you don't know what effect you might have on someone. But to see, I know 8,000, how many people were in that audience singing your own words and singing the melody, it just was, Plus the parents and the children were together lovingly and you know embracing each other. It was so beautiful and it was so meaningful. Mm. What was what was one of those first moments? I mean, you have so many amazing moments in your life and songs that you've created. 
do you remember one of the first times that you went, oh, I'm working with? Well, I remember the first time I heard my song on the radio. That was, I was driving through Laurel Canyon by the Canyon Country Store. Yeah. You know where that is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm driving my little car and I'm listening to Kiss FM and it says, hit bound. And Rick D says, um, and now, uh, now we're going to play the new release from Natalie Cole. And I'm listening to this song and I'm thinking, where do I know this song from? It sounds familiar to me until I realized it was my song and it was I Live For Your Love. And I pulled over to the side and started hysterical crying. And I wanted to call somebody, but I didn't, I don't think in those days there was, you know, it was the late, it was 89. And I don't remember if we had cell phones at that time, but but I was afraid that if I, that if I did try to call somebody, I'd miss this, hearing the song on the radio. So I just pulled over and cried. I just could not believe it, it was so, such a thrill. But you know, the thing about being a songwriter is you hear your song on the radio. And then when, after the song is a hit and it starts going down again, you have to do it all over again. You have to write another song and then another song. And you know, it, um, it's very fleeting. You, you know, the feeling you think you're gonna have, um, you don't quite have because it goes away so fast. Yeah. You know, you wait so many years for it to happen. And then when it does, it just lasts for just a short while you know, on the, on the charts and, uh, you know, and, and uh, then you have to try to do it again. Well, it's like an actor has to get a new role. Yeah. And, and it, it, you say it's fleeting, but for those who love that song, it's throughout their whole life. And uh, that I think is true. Look, I can't say, you know, I'm so lucky that Run To You was, was in the bodyguard and was written in 1991, I think. Yeah. And it, it's, 29 years later, and it's still, you know, thank God people sing it on American, they just sang it on American Idol last week. And I just got a request yesterday for The Voice. And, you know, and it, it, it just is amazing, you know, how, uh, what a life it has. I wouldn't mind having a couple of more of those kind of run to you songs. You that, know, was, was, that was so funny because I was, I was here with watching it with my mom and that song came on, I went, Hey, that's Alan's song. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you feel really good, you know. Um, and she sang it beautifully. She didn't get through, but you know, she, for some reason, the week before she didn't get through either. The audience, for some reason, she did not connect with the audiences, but she sang the song beautifully. Yeah. You no, know, I can't be responsible for everything. I can't say, well, it was my song that didn't get her through because that wouldn't be true. But um, but I was just very proud that she sang it. Well, Tom, since we're on run to you, um, I, you sent, we have the, the actual demo from that. Well, there's a story that goes behind the demo too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, um, how it all started is there was a, a breakdown sheet that every songwriter got about this new um, uh, movie that was being made starring Whitney Houston, Kevin Costner. And there were four main songs that they were looking for. Well, one ended up being I Will Always Love You, although if you want to know the truth, it was supposed to be what becomes of the broken hearted. But Paul Young released it as a single and it became such a big hit they couldn't use it. So Maureen Crow, the music supervisor, found, suggested I Will Always Love You. She doesn't always get the credit for it, but from what I understand, she was the one who found the song. Right. And, um, and so that was a Dolly Parton song. Then um, there was, uh, um, I'm Every Woman, which was, you know, so two of the four songs were songs that had already been famous. And yeah. then David Foster being the legendary producer of the, of the, you know, the soundtrack, um, you know, he, and he's a, such an incredible songwriter, you know, that he was going to land a song, he was going to write a song. And so he wrote with his then wife, Linda Thompson, I Have Nothing, great song, I Have Nothing. Well, there was really one slot, slot open, and that was a song for a breakup song. And I was in the middle of a breakup at that time, 10 year breakup in real life. Yeah. And I don't know, do you know the story? Cause it's kind of an interesting story. Um, and this, per, you know, we had broken up and gotten back together so many times and it was not, it wasn't the healthiest relationship. I'll just say that. And finally I said, this, you know, it's, this is it. So I dropped this particular person off at their apartment building in Hollywood. 
they lived in a building with a glass staircase. So I could watch them as they're walking up the stairs. And my initial instinct while I was watching them and where I said goodbye, um, I wanted to run to that person. Mm. But instead, I stayed in my car. I pulled out a piece of, piece of paper or, and I put it on the steering wheel and I wrote, I want to run to you. I want to run to you. And that was just like I always did before. I'm knocking at your door. I want to run to you. How I want to come to you. But you're not there to run to anymore. I wrote that right at the steering wheel. As you know, that was the original breakup lyric. But um, is that how you uh, usually get creative moments? That all of a sudden you just pick up the paper and do it? Yes. And and I uh, coincided with the the scene. We wrote it specifically for Whitney, but it coincided with a breakup that I was going through. Right. So, um, but, um, and then we, you know, we got it to Jerry Griffith at the record label and he, he was uh, Clive's right-hand man. And we figured if, if Jerry liked it, he'd play it, he'd bring it and put it right on Clive's desk, which is what ended up happening. That was a strat strategic thing we did on our, our, with our publishers. It was strategic. We didn't, we didn't really have an outlet to get to Clive. So we got to, Jer um, uh, Jerry Griffith, and um, we I, hoped that it, what would happen happened. And so I got a phone call from Clive Davis, and he said, "You're going to like this phone call. Um, I really like your song for the Bodyguard, and so does Whitney. Call me. At the I'm at the Beverly Hills Hotel." And um, we met with them, and uh, he asked us to re to do the demo, to do the make it. Can you make it more like a Whitney demo? Yeah. And we, 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 well, because it was only a piano vocal with uh, maybe a string line. And it was on top of it, it was out of time. So um, what, when we realized what we, he was talking about, we, think, we thought we had to fill up the demo with a little more of a track. Yeah. But it took us four hours just to do a drum track because it wasn't in time. It was slow and then it got fed. So it was such a, it was a real bitch to get that drum track. And, we, and then we added maybe a little bit more to it. And then we resubmitted it and Clive said, okay, I'm gonna send it to you know, the film company. And then I we got a phone call from Mick Jackson, the director. And he said, we look, here's, here's the kick all. You think you, you know, it's, it's never easy. And we're so excited. We have a song that they wanna do on the, in the bodyguard. And we'll get a phone call from Mick Jackson, the director. And he goes, we love your song for the bodyguard. However, the minute you hear however or but, yeah. uh, the scene was originally a breakup scene and now we've changed to a take a chance on me scene. This is what he literally said. He said, it wouldn't be too much of a problem to rewrite the whole lyric, right? <laughs> Jed and I looked at each other. We thought we were gonna die, but we said, oh, no problem. We hung up the phone. We thought we were gonna kill ourselves. Clive said, I heard what happened. Um, uh, before you send it, the rewrite to Jer uh, to uh, Mick, please send it to me first for approval. And um, we had to rewrite the whole entire lyric. And so from the, like I told you, the original chorus was, I want to run to you, I want to run to you. Like I always did before, come knocking at your door, I want to run to you, how I want to come to you. But you're not there to run to anymore. That was the breakup song. We ended up changing it to, I want to run to you, I want to run to you, won't you take me in your arms, keep me safe from harm, I want to run to you. But if I come to you, will you stay or will you run away? So, you know, and so we sent that, Clive liked it. He said, send it to the film company. And then the rest was history. But it was, we, we were sweating bullets through it. Oh my gosh. And, you know, and, then we, and, then, and then we got, we were invited to go to the recording session to watch Whitney record the vocals. It was like a who's who. Kevin Costner was there. David Foster, the producer was there. Whitney, of course, was there, and and the head of film music at Warner Brothers, the incredible Gary LaMelle, who has unfortunately passed away, and he was just the most wonderful, lovely man. He helped us all through this whole process from beginning to end, and it was an exciting, it was so exciting to be there, and, um, you know, watching, Whit I, I would say, and Whitney didn't feel well that day. She right. could barely speak. Um, but when she got into the vocal booth, her voice was like, we couldn't believe it was the same person who couldn't speak when she was talking. 
um, she and she, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of the actual final vocal was the day we were there in the recording studio. So anyway, it was a day I'll never forget. Yeah. Um, I remember Magic Johnson was on the screen tell, telling everybody that he was HIV positive. Wow. While watching on this, in this recording studio. So I'm, I think that is the accurate thing. I, th I think I remember watching that. Well, I'm going to look up the date to make sure that I'm giving you the accurate thing, but I'm pretty sure I remember us all watching um, Magic Johnson. Anyway. What, you know, what a uh, great day that was. It was an incredible day. Ah. So, and, and there you go. There you go. Just another day at the office. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, and then we were invited, Kevin Costner invited us to the video shoot of her with the long hair and the white flowing um, chiffon kind of outfit that she, when she's running and, the, and you know, so, yeah. um, and you know, the, the reality is, is that when we got there was a cavernous setup, yeah. you know, a studio. And at the end, we saw this girl in an office. Oh my God, she's, she must be playing Whitney Stan and she's so gorgeous. She's even more gorgeous than Whitney Houston. And then all of a sudden she raised her hand. And she says, Alan, Judd. And then she comes running to us and it was Whitney Houston. Ah. Looking like beyond breathtakingly gorgeous. Wow. She was that beautiful. And Natalie Cole, when you met, you know, when you saw Natalie Cole, Natalie Cole was so beautiful. She was so nice to me. And she was, but she was so beautiful all the time. When I saw her, I just couldn't, you know, couldn't believe how beautiful Whitney and Natalie were. But, um, but anyway, that's my Whitney Houston story. And then when we got nominated for an Oscar, um, she sent us two dozen roses. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Um, you know, um, I honestly know that I feel like, you know, Robin Crawford was very wonderful and instrumental. She was Whitney's right-hand woman um, and she really cared about Whitney. I honestly feel that she had been stayed in the family of, you know, she had, she married Bobby and whatever the trouble there was, but Robin took care of Whitney and cared for her so much. I honestly believe if Robin would have been there and still in the picture that Whitney would still be alive today because Robin would not have let that happen. But I believe that it was Robin who probably said, you know, let's send them two dozen roses. And I still have the card and I, you know, anyway, those are beautiful what memories. What neat memories, what moments. I mean, that's something special. I agree. Trying hard to find your dreams 